Hi guys, we're down here at uh, Nelson Park in Mount Pleasant. It's a beautiful day, it's uh, gorgeous out, there's no rain clouds in sight, nice background, waterfall. What a, what a beautiful setting to talk about our relationship with God in, in this beautiful place that God has provided. So today we're going to look at another guy from uh, the Bible that, that failed big time. He really screwed things up. The guy's name is Judas. Now, we all really have heard the story about Judas. We know that, that Judas was a man that betrayed Jesus at the end of his ministry. But what we also know is that, that Jesus handpicked this guy. He handpicked this guy who was going to walk with him for three and a half years, who was going to, to be there when Jesus was getting ready to sleep for the night around the campfire and they're, and they're all sitting there talking about the coming kingdom of God and all of those things. Judas was privy to all of this kind of stuff. Things that you and I would, would, would probably love to have heard firsthand. But Judas heard all of these things and he still fell big time and he still betrayed Jesus Christ. So what did, what did Judas do? Well, we know that, that he helped himself to the treasury. He was, as, a, as the, the, the Jesus disciples, that whole ministry traveled around from town to town. Uh, Judas was in charge of the treasury. And every once in a while, you know, when he wanted some extra cash, what did he do? He stuck his hand in there and he helped himself to whatever it was that he wanted. We know that Judas was a man that was extremely worldly. We know that he looked after his own welfare. He sought only the betterment of himself. He wasn't that interested in the poor and some of the other people that they encountered on a regular basis. And we also know that Judas was very, very untrustworthy. What about you and I? Are we any different? Do we not take advantage sometimes of somebody who gives you the wrong amount of change? You ever done that? You ever heard of anybody that's done that? How about on our taxes? Have you ever thought about, well, let's see, did I really give this much to the church last year? And, you know, you read about people that, you know, if everybody in the United States paid the taxes that they really owe, then the, the, balance, the budget would be balanced. You read about those things. You hear about those things. What about you and I? Do we compromise our lives, too? the same way that Judas did? I think the answer to that is yes. If you have ever looked at the character of Judas and felt that you were better than him, you know what? You need to bag that idea right now because all of us are fallen people and all of us in our own ways, we do the wrong things. We make bad choices. We fall away from God. And we betray our Lord and our Savior from time to time. The thing about Judas and studying the character of Judas, theologians over the years have developed a lot of different ideas about why Judas fell like he did, why he failed big time. There's a lot of common thought out there, and I think as we look at that, it'll help you and I in our Christian walk to make sure and to think through uh, the things that so that we don't fall into the same problem areas. One of the things that that um, theologians have discussed for years is that the failure of Judas was ordained by God. That for God to lay out His plan of salvation for humankind, for God to come in the form of His of a Son, and to live a perfect life, and to die on a cross providing salvation to those that would believe that God needed somebody to go against Jesus, to turn Jesus over to the religious leaders, that God needed somebody from an earthly perspective. Well, that thought has been out there for many, many years. I don't know if I like that idea or not. But then again, maybe I do. Because if God is the one that ordained the failure of Judas, then really it almost indicates that Judas isn't responsible, doesn't it? It almost says to us that, well, he was just the unlucky one that got picked. That all of a sudden, 
God says, I'm going to unfold my plan of salvation. Jesus, now you're born of a virgin. And when it's time for you to die for the sins of the world, i got to pick somebody who's going to betray you. Well, unfortunately, Judas, it's you. That concept or that idea tells me that eh, maybe he's not really all to blame. Maybe not so much. So that idea is one of the ones that kind of is free-floating out there in, in theological circles. Another idea that's floating around out there about the failure of Judas and why he, he fell so hard was that it was simply his free will. If you think about it, Judas had to make the decision uh, to go ahead and betray Jesus. Judas, he had the privilege of walking with Jesus for three and a half years. I mean, he was there when they bedded down for the night. He was there when they were welcomed into towns. He was there when, when they were chased out of towns. All of those things. And Judas heard some of those intimate conversations, those things that aren't recorded in the Scripture. I can't imagine Judas walking along the road with all the disciples following Jesus, and, and all of a sudden Jesus and, and Judas find themselves ahead of the group, and they're having a conversation. Think about the privilege of those times that Judas had to commune with Jesus, and yet he still betrays him. Judas had to make the choice that he was going to betray his Lord and Savior. He was the one that told the chief of the, the, uh, the religious leaders that he would provide for them this Messiah, this self-appointed Messiah for a price. Judas is the one who went to them and said, yeah, I'll turn him in to you, but you're going to owe me some money. It's interesting at the Passover meal, that Last Supper meal, Jesus warns all of the disciples about this coming crucifixion and what's going to happen to him. At the dinner table, they're all sitting there, and Jesus says to them, he says, The Son of Man will go as it is written of him, but woe to that man by whom the Son of Man is betrayed. He tells the disciples Guys, I'm going to go and I'm going to be betrayed and I'm going to be turned over to the religious leaders and then I'm going to be crucified. And, and, but you know what? Woe to that guy who betrays me. And he's telling this to all of them. He's giving Judas this warning. Another idea out there is that Judas simply was greedy. Judas wanted the money. Judas decided that you know, Jesus or no Jesus, uh, I'm going to turn him in and I'm going to use this opportunity to fatten my own pockets. And that's a very possible one. I know a lot of people do a lot of strange things for the simply, you know, just to gain wealth, just to simply fatten their own wallets. The Gospel of John tells us that greed in the life of Judas stays and keeps in in with his character that he was the treasurer that he used to help himself the gospel of john tells us that judas was just a plain thief the gospel of john says not because he cared about the poor but because he was a thief referring back to the time when when the the perfume that was worth almost a year's wages was poured over the head of jesus which was anointing him for his death. And Judas speaks up and says, oh man, you guys are wasting all that. That, that should have been sold and the money given to the poor. And John says, that's, that's crap. Because what really he was worried about was getting that money all for himself. Actually, you know what? Maybe it wasn't greed. The more I think about it. Because back in those days, when you look at the context of what took place, 30 pieces of silver is what uh, we read that Judas got for betraying Jesus. 30 pieces of silver was not a lot of money. If you're like me and a lot of other people that read this passage for the first time, we think about 30 pieces of silver must have been a lot of money. It really wasn't. There are some biblical references that kind of uh, show us that. One of them uh, comes from the book of Exodus. We read that 30 pieces of silver was the price that was paid for a slave. In the book of Ezekiel, we read that 30 pieces of silver was the wages 
that were paid to a shepherd who was at the lower end of the class. I mean, he was, he was a nobody. And they would go out there and stay with the sheep all night. And what 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 they get out of it? They got 30 pieces of silver. And they certainly were not rich by any certain means. So maybe it wasn't greed. Another idea that comes up is that maybe Judas was simply impatient and frustrated. I can appreciate that one a little bit. Maybe Judas was was so tired of listening a, to Jesus about the coming kingdom of God. Maybe he simply got tired of waiting. Maybe he simply was saying, you know, I, I heard you talk about the coming kingdom of God. Uh, I've seen glimpses of your glory. Uh, I believe that you're the long-awaited Messiah. I believe that you're the one that's going to lead this revolution and, and bring the nation of Israel back into all of its former glory. But I don't see you doing anything, Jesus. It's been three and a half years. I've given up everything to follow you, and we're getting nowhere. We're still wondering where our next meal is going to come from. We're still sleeping out in the open. We're still oppressed by these Romans, and nothing's happening. I can appreciate, I really can, I can appreciate the aspect that maybe Judas was simply getting tired of waiting. Maybe he simply was thinking that maybe Jesus needs a little help here. So maybe what I'll do is I'll turn Jesus over to the religious leaders and that'll force his hand. Jesus now, if I turn him over to religious leaders and put him up against a wall, maybe now he'll have to bring in the kingdom of God. He'll be forced to bring forward the nation of Israel back to its former glory and all of those wonderful things. You see, I wonder if that's not part of the answer that he saw to the frustration and the impatience of waiting for Jesus. I'm going to try him on. I'm going to make him play his hand. Yeah, we all get tired of waiting for things sometimes, don't we? We do. We get tired of waiting. We get impatient. We get frustrated as we pray year after year after year for the dear loved one that's suffering with cancer. We pray and we ask for help in a marriage that's falling apart and it goes month after month after month and we pray and we're on our knees every night and we don't see a whole lot happening. It's really easy to see how Judas and the rest of them could have become so frustrated with what was going on as far as God's timing and the way that Jesus was, was ushering in this kingdom that they're all waiting for. I remember reading a blog recently, and it was, it was a blog that came out of a church that had gone to uh, Kenya on a mission trip. And as they went to Kenya, uh, they went to a very remote area, and there was a tremendous amount of poverty. Uh, there was death. There was starvation. There was all of these horrific things taking place. And the group wrote in their blog as they were there, as well as when they got back, how frustrating it was that they would pray and they would talk to God and they would, they would ask God to, you know, can we help these people a little more than what we're doing? Can we usher in this kingdom and, and establish these people the way that they should be? And, and they felt that frustration too. All of us experience frustration and impatience from time to time, especially when it comes to the plan of God especially when it comes to the loved ones in our life that we want to help, we want to see come into a relationship with Christ, like the relationship that you and I might have. But you know what? If he thought that betraying Jesus would launch the revolution, if he thought that that revolution would lead to Israel's freedom and reestablishment as as a nation of people that God had chosen. And yet he turns Jesus over to the religious leaders, and what do they do? They turn him over to the Romans and say, kill him. It's no wonder that Judas became so distressed, because if that is the reason why he did that, then his plan just blew up in his face. He wanted to incite Jesus to go ahead and bring forth the coming kingdom, but it didn't work that way. Instead, they turn him over to religious leaders or the, to the Romans, and they're going to kill him. 
if they kill him, then, then there's not going to be a rebellion. It's easy to see how Judas not only was frustrated and impatient, but then all of a sudden he's distressed beyond belief because the plan blows up in his face, if that is why. There's, a, there's another reason that Judas might have done what he did. And I actually think this is probably one of the better reasons to consider. I wonder if Judas just lost all hope that Jesus was truly the Messiah. I wonder if he lost hope after all of those years, after all of the things that they went through, that Jesus really is not able to bring in the kingdom of God, that that he's just a good man, he's just maybe a prophet, he's just, you know, a religious person that God works through from time to time. I wonder if it was not just, you know, it wasn't a situation of greed or, or anything else, it was just that he lost hope in Jesus. I can see how he might do that. Remember at the Last Supper, Jesus announces to them that one of them will betray him. Now this is important. Here they are at the Last Supper. They don't know it's the Last Supper. And Jesus says, one of you is going to betray me. And we know from the readings that all of the disciples are greatly upset over this. They were really worried about it. And they, and they asked him, they said, is it I, Lord? Think about it. You're sitting around the table with Jesus and you can tell that something's going on. And, and Jesus says, well, one of you is going to betray me. And they're like, whoa, really? Jesus, Lord, is it I? Is it me? But Judas doesn't respond that way. Instead, what Judas does is he says something just a little bit different, but in the context of that day, it is so, so important. I don't want you to miss this. Judas responds and he says, is it I, Rabbi? You see, the context of of the day back then to call Jesus Lord was an Old Testament term that referred to the person of God the disciples are saying God is it going to be me that 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 turns against you that that you know betrays you but not Judas Judas he comes around and he says rabbi or teacher and actually that term was a negative term uh, way back in uh, the book of uh, Matthew. In Matthew's Gospel, rabbi is a negative term. Chapter 23, Jesus says that the scribes and the Pharisees love being called rabbi by others. Kind of has a negative context to it. I wonder if Judas was maybe all of these things, somewhat frustrated and somewhat lost, but more than anything, Maybe he simply lost hope. Maybe he simply got to the point to where he no longer believed in the divinity of Jesus, no longer believed that Jesus is the coming Messiah and is going to reestablish the kingdom of God here on the earth. I don't know. But you know what the really sad part of this whole deal is? The really, really sad part is if Judas had held on for a couple more days, if Judas had waited till Sunday, then he could have joined and go, gone to the, uh, to the tomb and witnessed the empty tomb. He could have seen the stone turned away. He could have been with the disciples when Jesus reappeared to them and said, hey, I'm back, friends. If Judas had simply held on a little bit longer and not letting himself fall by the wayside, not letting his hope in Jesus Christ wane, if he had waited, he too could have been forgiven by the blood of Christ, even for that offense, for turning away from Jesus, for, for, for turning him over, and if he had only waited. How many of us need to do the same thing in our life? How many of us turn away from God, maybe in our heart, or turn away from Jesus in our heart, or, or we, we fail to see Jesus as the Lord of all, and we get frustrated and we start to lose that hope and, and things get in the way and we forget who the personhood of Jesus Christ actually is. Lord of everything, creator God. Maybe you and I need to remember that 
the next time that you and I start to wane in our, in our hope, we start to wonder about what God is doing in the world, I think it would be a great thing if we simply remember the story of Judas and how if Judas had remained faithful and held on to that hope, how Judas too would have been forgiven and would be enjoying the kingdom of heaven. Thanks for being with us today. God bless you this week, and I just hope and pray that, that this story of Judas just kind of permeates your life all week long. Thanks, and God bless.